I want to go ahead and introduce our moderator for today. Nina Moreno is an associate professor in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. And more importantly, for my purposes, she's the interim director for the Incubator for Innovative Teaching in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, she uh, teaches Spanish and second language acquisition in the Department of Languages, Literatures, and Cultures. And she's one of the core faculty in the linguistics program. She also directs the Foreign Language Teaching Certificate Program, which trains students to become K through 12 world language teachers in our state. Uh, her research interests include pre-service teacher training, computer-assisted language learning, foreign language curriculum, and depth of processing. And again, uh, uh, one of the things we like to point out is she is one of the most honored teachers on campus, has received the Mortar Board Award, the Sigma Delta Pi Hispanic Honor Society Excellence in Teaching Award for two consecutive years, and the Garnet Apple Award awarded by the Center for Teaching Excellence. So you are in great hands to learn about engagement. Nina, we'll turn it over to you. I'm excited to bring to you today a panel of four expert teachers on how to make your teaching more engaging. And they are in order of appearance today. Catherine Riker, an assistant professor at the School of the Earth, Ocean, and Environment. She has been a close friend and collaborator of the incubator throughout. So thanks for being here, Catherine. Kristen Harrell is a PhD candidate in the English program and a Belinsky Fellow. She is an alumna of the graduate student leadership team that we also uh, have at the incubator. Hayden Smith, professor in the Department of Criminology and Criminal Justice. He was one of our past faculty associates, and you'll hear uh, about one of the projects that he, he's worked for us on. And Rhonda Sanders from the Department of Mathematics. She too was a faculty associate from our inaugural class of associates. And currently she is the assistant director of the incubator and the creator and facilitator of Cat Corner, of which you will learn more through her presentation. So as you all know, um, the backdrop of the panel is Kavanaugh's 2019 article that you all got a copy of. And through today's presentation, our panelists will show you how to connect teaching to one or more of the principles described in the article, which were emotions, performance, community, and stories. After the four presentations, we will have time for Q&A. And with that, I will let Catherine take it away. All right, thank you so much, Nina. Um, so I wanted to start off with something that I really liked out of the Sarah Rose or the Kavanaugh article, which was we hear this phrase active learning a lot and it, it gets to the point where it may not mean a, a whole lot to us. Um, it's this phrase, it's this thing that we wanna do in our classrooms, we know it's a way of engaging students, but it's fairly nebulous. So I like how she lays it out with the, the four different ways that we can engage our students. There's a, a similar model that um, I and some colleagues have been working with in examining active learning literature, uh, which is on the screen here. It's a very pretty, very many part uh, Venn diagram, uh, but it basically centers around the same idea in the Kavanaugh article, which is that attention is the price we pay for learning. Attention is the price we pay for learning. So if you are distracted while watching a TV show or watching your, your favorite webinar and you find half an hour later, huh, what? who did get chopped first on Chopped was watching Food Network? It, it's because your brain wasn't paying attention. It wasn't literally paying that, that cost of attention. Uh, and so we can think about it in the, the four frames of the Kavanaugh article. Um, this is just a, a very similar, but slightly different way of, of conceptualizing it, where we think about the different types of engagement, ways that we can engage with material. So Augie uh, or Nate was saying, oh, you know, it's the, it's the material that's gotten us up this morning and all at our desks on a Friday morning at nine o'clock. That's emotional investment. I'm interested, I value the material, I'm motivated to attend because I see this as something that's worthwhile to my classes. I think this is material that I'm gonna be able to turn around and put into practice Monday. Uh, we can be behaviorally engaged. So some of that is just simply, 
I'm sitting at my computer. I am, I have my eyes focused. Maybe I'm taking notes. These are ways that I can behaviorally engage with the material and with a presentation. Um, I can be cognitively engaged with a presentation or with a class. Um, so I can be thinking through, am I learning what, I, what I'm supposed to be learning? Do I need to engage in some self-regulation? Do I need to change my strategies? And then I can have a sense of agentic engagement. Agentic engagement is really just taking ownership over learning. And you've experienced this if you've ever had a student stay after class and said, you know, uh, professor, I was just wondering how this connected to this other thing in my life. They, they've agentically engaged. They're taking ownership of the learning process beyond anything that you've sort of set up intentionally for them. Uh, and that's something that you know you as adult learners uh, are engaging in today. You've you've made a choice to be at this particular webinar. You'll make a choice about thinking about how to uh, sort of link this material to what you're doing in class. And there's tons of room for overlap. Uh, so that's all the the Venn diagram bubbles. We can be both agentically engaged and emotionally engaged, or behaviorally and cognitively engaged. There's some magical overlap of all three. Uh, but we think of active learning as when we're engaged in at least one of those type of ways, or one of the, the four frames is introduced by Kavanaugh. And why do we do this? Uh, there have been a lot of studies of active learning, even though it's sort of this nebulous concept. Uh, researchers, education researchers have, have started to look at what's the impact of using active learning strategies in our classrooms. Um, and I, I'll point out two recent meta-analyses that, that combed the literature and looked at what other studies had found. Um, and actually, I'm going to start with the, the graph on this next slide. Uh, the first one, a meta-analysis from Freeman, looked at 225 papers that quantified student performance as either their average exam score or their percent likelihood to fail a class. And what they found was that classes that shifted from traditional lecture uh, in orange to active learning, however the, the teacher or the article conceptualized that, had a dramatic shift towards a lower percentage of students who failed the class, and they saw an improvement in the average exam score. So students in active learning classes on average have a six point higher exam score, and those who are in traditional classes are actually one and a half times more likely to fail. So this is a way, embedding these active learning strategies is a way that you can help set your students up for success. Uh, and this second meta-analysis actually uh, kind of took an even um, closer look than Freeman did at who succeeds in these classes uh, as you shift towards active learning. And so they looked at three different combinations of treatment. There's passives, this is a, a sort of a, a lecture you know, you walk in, you listen to the lecture, you take some notes, you close your book, you walk out. A low degree of active learning. So maybe the instructor tries something here or there, you know, I'll, I'll ask a question, maybe at the beginning of lecture, maybe at the end. And then a high degree of active learning where act, these active learning strategies, many of which we're gonna talk about today, are really embedded throughout the class. And what they found is that in that low treatment, um, there's a, there's a slight dip, it's almost distracting for students in a way, like, oh, wait, he's asking me a question, I need to do something. Uh, but but uh, if it's done consistently throughout the class, it actually closes the achievement gap, and it closes the achievement gap even more dramatically for underrepresented students. So the Freeman paper shows us that active learning strategies benefit everyone on the whole, um, the, the second study, the Theobald study that just came out in 2020, uh, or in 21 now, uh, showed that it disproportionately is going to help your underrepresented students. Um, so just a little bit more motivation. If you weren't already motivated by the Kavanaugh article, now you have a little, little extra um, uh, emotional engagement with the material. And there, there's tons of different active learning strategies. Um, we're we're going to showcase four ways that, that we embed active learning today in the panel. Uh, I'll share a couple of years ago now, uh, some colleagues and I wrote an article where we did a lit review of active learning strategies. And we, we found 11 uh, that are up on the screen now, different ways that you can use from 
uh, really small things that require not a lot of preparation. So something like a think pair share is uh, I'm going to ask you a question, take 20 seconds to think about it on your own, pair up with someone around you, and then share out your answer to the class. Uh, or in the virtual world, I'm going to give you a prompt, I'm going to send you to breakout rooms, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to think about it, and then I'm going to come back and I'm randomly going to call the numbers of two breakout rooms to share with the group. Um, that's something that requires a low degree of prep, uh, whereas something like teaching with models or perhaps role playing takes uh, a little bit more of an investment, um, but also will will take a longer portion of your teaching. I know we're going to hear a little bit about role playing a little bit later uh, this morning. Um, so I put that in the chat. The, the purpose of that lit review is really just to say, like, here's an introduction to each of these 11 strategies. Here's the literature that supports each. And then here's how you kind of engage in each one. Uh, so with that, I'll tell you, yeah, that, that's kind of the high level abstract view of active learning and, um, you know, why we use active learning. I want to give you an example from my class that I'm teaching this semester, uh, because I, I think one of the perspectives that I can bring to the panel is, is teaching a large intro class, which some of you may be doing or may have to do at some point uh, in your tenure here at South Carolina. So uh, my class, it's an introduction to the earth. Uh, it's a physical geology course. This semester, I have 170 students. They're almost all non-majors, which is very consistent with the population in that class. We do have a lab. Um, the course is all online, including the labs this semester. Uh, it's a mix of synchronous and asynchronous. And most students are in there because it's a Carolina core course. They get credit for a, uh, their scientific literacy requirement. And one of my goals this semester as I was setting up the class is uh, to strengthen collaboration and communication. So it's really easy, as we all are way too familiar with, it is really easy uh, for students to sign into their online class and kind of check out, walk away, not be cognitively engaged, maybe doing something else, maybe sc uh, scrolling Instagram, whatever. Um, and so what I wanted to do was break up the course in such a way that they were oriented around their lab groups. Um, so these smaller groups within the 170, they're broken up into sections of 24. Um, and I wanted them to really spend a lot of time throughout the semester working with their lab groups, not just on their assigned lab day. Um, another goal I had for the course was to really minimize the cost. Uh, so traditionally, we require a textbook. Uh, sometimes we require an eye clicker. Um, this semester, we're using an OER textbook, which is an open educational resource. So it's free to students. Um, and then we've combined it with a program called Perusal, uh, which is also free for students and it's free for the instructor. And that's what I'm going to be talking a little bit about today. Perusal lets me put students into their lab groups um, to work on the reading together. Um, and I, I just put these links on the screen. We'll, we'll share the slides. Uh, or the slides are available to you afterwards or you can get them from the recording. But um, the library has a great guide on using OERs if it's something that is of interest to you for your course. Um, or if you want to take a sneak peek at the book I'm using, you're welcome to see what a geology textbook looks like online. So why Perusal? Um, when I was considering what I wanted to do this semester and how I wanted to engage my students in, in all these you know, emotional engagement, community engagement, um, I looked at some of the research behind this particular program. It, it basically brings up the textbook online, allows them to highlight portions of the textbook and comment on it. So they can tag the text with questions, with comments, with observations. Uh, they can hashtag it with things like definitions, important point, uh, exam, question, interesting, however they want to do it. Uh, and the more they annotate thoughtfully, the higher their score will be. So some of those examples I just said, you know, definition, great. That will actually score them zero points towards their total. But if they ask something like one of my students asked yesterday, uh, the book says we usually use ophiolites to, to do this thing. What about xenoliths? It's like, I don't know that I've ever had a 100 level student accurately use both those words, not only in a sentence, <laughs> uh, but in a really thoughtful question. And Perusal knows based, uh, based on its AI matrix behind uh, the, the program to score that with a higher score. Uh, and there's lots of other data to support this. It, it gives um, at the end of the week, or actually before we go to class on Thursday, 
it gives me as the instructor some feedback on what students are really interested in learning, what they're engaging with uh, cognitively or emotionally. Um, and I'll show you just a quick example of what this looks like from the student end. So this is an example with a physics book. Uh, you can see Allison, Beth, and Corey have highlighted parts of the text. Um, Allison, this goes A, B, C. Allison's examples are really high quality annotations. Um, Beth is maybe slightly less thoughtful, but is still with it. Corey, it will actually know things like this. You know, I remember in high school being amazed. Like, yeah, yeah that's fine. It's not going to give you a lot of points for that. Uh, but this is basically what it looks like from the student end. It's a conversation going on on the side, and they can respond to each other. So you can see Corey asked a question, why is this? I don't get it. And Allison has responded to him. And Corey will get some points for asking an engaging question. Allison will get some points for engaging with another question. Students can upvote questions that they like to say, yes, this is one that I have too. They can upvote particular like helpful responses um, so that those rise to the top of the, the student view. And again, this is all happening within their lab section um, or by lab section. So they're only seeing people that they're also going to see during their lab meetings later in the week. And then on uh, to prepare for class on Thursdays, which is our synchronous lecture day, I actually have the option um, to open up a what they what the program calls a confusion report, but it, it looks for questions that have high levels of engagement, so lots of upvoting, lots of responses, uh, or things that um, you know have pretty common words in them. And so rather than read all you know 400 and uh, let's see what was the number on the last slide. Uh, 426 comments and 80 questions, rather than need to go through all of those, I look at the, the top performing uh, questions and comments and think about, okay, are there any of these that I want to dive in deeper uh, to on, you know, on our Thursday class? And then on Thursdays, we start off with engaging questions of the week. We take uh, a few of these and the instructor, uh, myself, talks through them shares a couple of thoughts, and then the students go to breakout rooms to talk about some of the others. So our entire class is actually based on what they found interesting or challenging from the reading. So they're engaging with the book throughout, hopefully cognitively. They're, they're thinking about the reading. They're doing it in within a community that's based around their lab section. There's an emotional component. This is the, this is the material that I'm interested in. I'm motivated to learn more. And it built on some of our motivation from uh, social media. Uh, so the way that you raise scores as a student on Perusal, there's lots of different ways you actually set it up as the, uh, as the instructor. Um, but these are three students who got a full uh, three out of three points. And this just shows you how they got their points. So uh, student one wrote eight annotations. They commented on the text eight times, whereas student three only made three annotations. Both got full credit uh, because while student one um, annotated a, a smaller portion of the text, perhaps, this person did more reading throughout the week. Uh, they had uh, more of the reading actually done. Um, let's see. And then all of them had some you know, well distributed annotations. So you can't just make five annotations on the same page and then be like, ah, my assignment's done. <laughs> Um, so lots of different ways the students don't aren't stressing out about, you know, did I get my number of annotations? And they can see their score. They can't see where the percentage is coming from. They just know that the more they engage with the book, uh, the more that they learn and the higher their score will be. So I, I find this aligned primarily with two parts of the Kavanaugh article. The, the first one, cognitive resources are limited, emotion trumps, right? So we're breaking the reading down into chunks. They're actually rewarded uh, with their, their score for spreading their reading out through the week, which we know uh, is tied on average to about a half, half uh, letter grade improvement. Um, it sucks you in with a lot of social media like features. So you can, you, can add, you can tag other people in your section. You can tag the instructor. You can use hashtags to organize the material. You'll get notifications if someone responds to your comment. We all know, OK, I want to go check that out. Um, and there's that upvoting system. Um, so they know they can get upvoted or upvote others. So it, it kind of plays on some of those same features of social media. Um, it allows students to make connections that are relevant to them. And then it turns the entire course. Even though we have 170 students, we're able to adapt the course to what the students are telling us is the most interesting thing, which especially for an intro science class where most of them are non-majors, 
that's something that one, they're, they're not particularly used to, uh, but also it's something that means that we have a really high engagement during our, our synchronous meetings, even though participation is not required. Um, so far, we've been at at least 150 of the 170 students online at all times. Um, and we haven't had to boot anyone for non-participation. We tell them to, to call us if they have a non-participating member in their group. Um, and then it plays off of that social community piece. So everyone's contributing, everyone's working on a shared project. They see each other during labs. So there's some um, sort of social buy-in that they need to be working on these assignments earlier in the week. Uh, and then it's building community in, in really small ways in those small lab groups. Um, I am going to talk today about role playing in the classroom and specifically um, go through a program called Reacting to the Past, which I used in spring of 2020, um, and how it fosters a sense of community uh, through these role playing games. Uh, some of you may be familiar with reacting to the past. Um, this is sort of going for those who aren't. This is going over um, what the program is and also how to use it in the class, uh, both in person or as many of us are today online. Um, so, um, how do reacting games work? Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, for these games, students take on actual historical roles during a pivotal moment in history. Um, and by pivotal moment in history, what I mean is a major decision in uh, a historical moment or a scientific debate or um, a cultural expansion, etc. So they take on a historical role and while they're obliged to adhere to what beliefs would be at that time or for that specific character that they're playing, they also have to devise their own means of persuading. So they're reenacting this famous debate. And the fascinating thing about reenacting is the students are experiencing whether or not the outcome was inevitable. And so they're using their critical sk thinking skills to explore the issue and really dig deep into the thoughts and the influences that inspired some of the pivotal moments in history. Um, instructors for reacting games play a very uh, fascinating part where they let the students lead the class. Uh, for many people, this is intimidating or a, a, little, a little frightening. And I admit, I felt a little frightened at first too. Um, but what you do is you let the students um, go their own ways, have their debates, et cetera. But in the meantime, you are still moderating. You are still present uh, to kind of guide them and you can guide them through small notes that you pass or through suggestions after class, et cetera. Um, students as individuals and as teams must pursue a course of action to try to quote win the quote game uh, and so there is an outcome that they're looking for and typically with a reacting game uh, this ends in a final vote or something like that. So um, for example I want to go over the one that I did to give you sort of a concrete um, example. Um, I used the reacting game Stages of Power, which is Shakespeare and Marlowe, and I actually said it's the 17th century here. It's really the last decade of the 16th century is when this takes place. It's 1582. Um, and so the premise for the game that we played in my classroom is that Queen's, Queen Elizabeth's Privy Council is staging a play for the Queen. And so only one troop can perform their play. And so the students are divided into historical members, uh, such as the rival theater companies of Shakespeare and Marlowe, or the Privy Council, who ultimately decide which play um, is staged. And there's also some influential socialites who have a little social capital that they can use uh, within the game. Um, and what they do is they, have these persuasive pamphlets that they um, use to communicate with students. They can do it with letters, with their classmates, argumentative speeches, um, all of the games feature debates. And the actors each present the importance of their plays while highlighting the deficiencies of their opponent's plays. So for instance, in the game that I ran, um, the students had to read either Shakespeare's Richard III 
or Marlowe's Dr. Faustus. And these are hard primary sources, but the students read them. And also, as I'll talk about in a minute, they also read other primary sources from that time period, uh, various letters from political officials or religious tracts, so that they could see how these um, events were culturally influenced. The finale of the game in which I um, staged with class was that the winning troupe performs scenes um, of their play for the class. And then students are debriefed on how the actual historical event played out. So they get a little context of what really happened versus how it played out with their group. Um, so my game I did for spring 2020 was half a semester long. Um, that, that scares a lot of instructors, but it was eight weeks and it actually worked out really well, especially since, um, as everybody knows, that after spring break portion of the class was uh, shifted to online. So it had its challenges. Um, the game became completely different. But if you're wanting to use reacting in your classroom, you don't have to commit to eight weeks. Um, they have quite a few full length games if you do want to commit the time to a longer game. Um, these can last weeks to months. And whenever you look at instructor materials, they give you ideas on how to make these schedules flexible, on how to sort of expand or contract uh, the games to what you need. They also have chapter length games, which can last from one to three class sessions. So some people feel that this, what, that this is a little more what they're going for. And so you can look on their website and see what they offer for chapter length games. And lastly, they have a couple micro, excuse me, several, not a couple, um, micro games, which are just one session games. And these are closer to the traditional idea of role playing in the classroom where you take one day, um, do a little activity with students acting out roles or in enacting a debate. Um, these are more familiar to a lot of instructors. And so they do also offer ideas for these. A lot of instructors ask me what types of topics do they cover. Um, I did literature and so they do have literature that they cover. Um, they also cover a lot of history as you would expect but also human rights, ethics, politics, gender studies, um, it's, and so on. And what you see to the left here are just a list of some of the titles that they have. And then also they have 30 published games right now. And then they have over 30 that are being reviewed for publication. So this is an ever expanding uh, catalog of classroom materials that you can access from them. And they provide everything you need to get this up and rolling. Don't be intimidated that it's too much work. It's a lot of work, but um, I found the investment of work I put in was worth it. I've mentioned that they provide a lot of sources. Um, so what I want to start with is the classroom resources they provide for students. The program is not set up so the student just receives a name and then they have to do a lot of research. Um, actually, the, the program is set up so each student is provided an individual role sheet and it has their character's name, which team they belong to, a short bio. And for some, this bio can be over a page long and for others, it can be just, you know, a paragraph or so. And it gives information on where they can find more about this specific historical figure. It also gives them objectives and victory conditions. For each student, they have a team objective. So for instance, in my class, whether their play is performed or not. But they also have individual personal objectives, like most people would during that time, where they have something that they want personally to happen, whether it's to find someone to print their play for them or to be able to act in the main role. And so this involves a lot of negotiation among students that's not just about winning the whole competition, but also meeting your personal goals. 
Um, these character sheets also tell them their responsibilities in the classroom, what assignments they will be uh, completing, what viewpoints their character probably had during this time, um, influential texts. So it gives, you know, here are primary sources that your character needs to read for information. And lastly, strategy advice. So it does say you might want to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so that really helps the students from the beginning learn what their objectives are. Reacting to the Past has published student handbooks, so you don't have to worry about compiling or printing out things for students. They have this book that you can order through university bookstores or online. They have it on Amazon, etc. And this includes everything the students need to get started. So it includes primary source readings, um, maps, historical timelines, game instructions, so that they know how each day is going to play out, and also assignment prompts, so that they can have ideas for what they want to write or what they need to include in their major persuasive speeches. Reacting also provides a lot of materials for instructors. Um, they have a website called the Reacting Consortium Library. This is a membership uh, organization, so you do have to pay a small uh, institutional fee or professor, professor fee uh, to access this, but it's well worth it because you receive access to the instructor manuals for all of the games that they have in publication right now. Um, the instructor manuals include you know, they're essential to the instructor. They include tips and procedures. Um, you don't have to worry about how to set up. They tell you how to set up the material, how to set up the classroom, what to discuss. They also offer sample class schedules, which you can see an example, just a clip of one over to the right. Um, they, show, they show in great detail what you need to be doing for each session and Sometimes they show you how you can combine more than one session if you need to condense it or how you can expand it into over two sessions, etc. They also have assignment ideas. You can either choose to print off the assignments or use the assignments verbatim or you can modify it. And with the reacting games, they do encourage you to modify it to suit your needs. You don't have to go strictly from the written materials. Lastly, and most essentially, they provide grading rubrics. Um, a lot of people are not familiar with grading both writing material and public speaking and participation all at once, um, especially with such a non-traditional activity. And this really lays out ways that you can judge the students and uh, evaluate how the students are doing on the separate topics in a fair manner. And these grading rubrics can be shared with students so they know what to expect from their writing and their performances. A lot of instructors ask me when I tell them about this, what about your curriculum objectives? You're spending half a semester on a game. Uh, what about what you have to fit into the class? What I found for my class is that it was actually able to meet the curriculum objectives I had in the class. Um, there was reading comprehension and criticism. They had to close read two major plays from the time in addition to historical accounts, etc. So they had to really process it in order to make their arguments and their persuasive speeches to people. Um, speaking of speeches, there was public speaking and debate. The students got familiar with working with other students. Critical thinking, they had to be able to use a little rhetoric in order to understand how to talk with different groups. They also learned tone and register, how they presented themselves to classmates, to opponents, versus to authority figures who were judging uh, their ultimate performance. They had collaboration with peers, uh, formal papers, and they also published formal papers in a blog that I had online. So they were learning how to write for other audiences, how to make their ideas clearer and persuasive. Um, they also they gained an understanding of cultural and political influences, so they really contextualized the material they were given for the class. Um, they did it in a creative way, but also with critical analysis. And I had rubrics so that I could make sure all the students understood what their objectives were and how I would be grading this. As I mentioned earlier, my class had to switch online because of the pandemic. 
Um, the reacting games are created initially for in-person interactions. But with the shift online for a lot of professors, there are a lot of resources where they've shown professors how to switch these games online. And from what I found, I've played in-person games and then I moderated online game. And I've found that there are benefits to both that are a little different and sometimes you wouldn't expect them. Uh, in person, of course, you're gonna have interaction with the students. They're gonna be on these teams. They're in a set place at a set time with a set objective. And a lot of times that's really clear and really organized for students to work with. The debates are in real time. They're super interactive. Everyone's really um, able to be there and to respond immediately to others' opinions and facts. Uh, students don't ghost as easily. You don't wonder, are they present or not? You, they're actually in the classroom. Uh, they get to perform for one another. Since they're playing historical figures, there's a lot of um, elaborate you know, gestures that they make or costumes they can wear. They can really emote a lot in class to get their meaning across. And it's just less isolating than being behind a screen alone trying to do a group activity. Now, online, there's a lot more flexibility. Students were able to coordinate things on their schedules, uh, which were very conflicting. And so they could arrange everything either through message boards or through Zoom calls. They could find ways to connect with one another and I didn't have to schedule that time. They also had more anonymity because the students had secret objectives that they each had or personal objectives they had to work through chat they had to email each other separately they had to work with different people at different times and that allowed them to do a little bit of negotiating but they did so from the viewpoint of their character i had all the students sign up with only their character name so they never knew what classmate they were dealing with and they really enjoyed that because they said that it allowed them to be much freer and to experiment with how they used their voice how they made persuasive arguments several of them like to use the old english what they called old english uh, language they like to use shakespearean language to uh, write their essays and others did a lot of research and argued viewpoints they may not have argued in class if this were in person. Um, it also allows the writing to shine since they were doing blog posts. They were, see they were seeing their text public and understanding that. The multimodal format addresses many types of learning. Students, some students really loved being able to look at visuals. Some loved the video aspect. Some loved the reading and the writing aspect. So they were able to shine in whichever aspect they were the most strong in, especially in the group teamwork. And lastly, as I mentioned, with the personal goals and the anonymity, the students loved the subterfuge. Um, the actual goals and competition really sparked their interest and they got really creative. Um, speaking of really creative with the subterfuge, the picture in the middle you see here is a blackmail photo that one of my students um, sent to another player as blackmail to get their way. Um, and this was a little anachronistic, but it was pandemic. I let it fly. It was funny. Uh, and you have that option. You can dictate what the students do in the class and kind of know when to give them leeway or not. So in conclusion, the alignment with the principles of engagement in Kavanaugh's piece, this one really aligns with community and stories. Um, obviously community because the students are able to share and they're able to um, be with their teammates and really see one another's strengths and feel a lot of self-confidence here. Um, their experiential knowledge in the competition made it relevant to them. A lot of students said they never understood the impact from just reading the texts, but from acting out the conflicts during the time, they knew more of the nuance in the texts. They learned tools for public communication. In terms of stories, they identified with their characters. They wanted to know more, which typically with my literature classes, that's a hard engagement to get from students. They wanted to research and research and research, and I was very glad and, and very pleased with that. 
and students who were not very active in the classroom blossomed in the online game playing. Um, they really enjoyed the, the being someone else a little bit for the class and really getting involved with the material. So I really feel if you're interested in the reacting games, um, here are some links. Um, you can just, uh, I think you can access these. Otherwise, I'll put them in the chat as well. Um, the Reacting to the Past website, where you can get an overview. The Reacting Consortium Library, where you can sign up um, and, in view, and view the instructor materials. They also have a very active Facebook page called the Reacting Faculty Lounge. And you are welcome to um, log on there and join. And a lot of the instructors talk about the difficulties or the, the benefits or ways that they've modified their classes to go online, etc. It's a really vibrant and helpful group. So I hope some more of you will be willing to do the role play and be really interested in reacting to the past because it really changed um, my classroom dynamic and I loved it. So, so now I am going to switch over and pass the baton, so to speak, to Hayden Smith. I'm in the Department of uh, Criminology and Criminal Justice. And I wanted to start my little uh, section on active learning by talking about roles, because uh, I think if we start big picture, we can kind of see where I ended up with, with my class and some of the approaches that I took. Um, one of the things that I found over my career of teaching is uh, that we do change our roles. And most of the time we're doing that to uh, get some active learning going and we're usually watching the reaction of our students to see if it's working. Um, a lot of brand new professors will start off in the friend role and then they'll get frustrated with that. They'll try being an entertainer, maybe a taskmaster, uh, maybe emotional bargaining, like you don't need this information now but you will in the future. Um, trying to impose some sort of learning for learning's sake. Uh, acting as a parent, and sometimes we're doing all of those things at the same time. And I find that you can get frustrated and you'll feel like you're the only one. Um, and that there's some uh, possible solutions in, in my approach that, that, may, uh, that may help. So first, when we think about engaging students and active learning, um, Society has changed. Our students are busy, uh, particularly with COVID. We're doing everything online. Uh, they're balancing their, their work lives, their, their social lives, uh, everything else going on. And students have an inherent uh, kind of risk reward or effort reward calculation. Uh, you may wonder why the f if you're in a traditional class and you hand out a, a paper syllabus, the first thing that uh, students do is go right to the the grade sheet and the what's due on what date. And what they're doing, and students are pretty good at this, is they're doing a calculation of, well, what's, what are you asking of me and what can I get out of it? What effort do I put in for what grade? Not all students, but most students do some sort of calculation. And when we were students, we did a similar thing. Uh, some students may drop the class on the basis of that, um, but it, they are calculating their lives, their education, and all of those roles themselves into some sort of uh, efficiency timetable. And so we have to recognize that our student population has changed in some ways. Uh, the second challenge that I find for engaging students is uh, our passion or our expertise. Uh, we often assume it matches what the students are looking for, and that's not always the case. So if you think about your career, um, you've often moved into a, a small area of expertise. It's, it's, it's narrow. Uh, your decision to publish is optional. Uh, your effort in that area is totally up to you. You have kind of complete control. And then you compare it to some of these large undergraduate classes that have been mentioned. And in, in some cases, they're mandatory for students. The students just kind of want a, a general sense of the class. Um, and this is actually why we also have departments where uh, an academic in the faculty has a, has a skill set that's very narrow and focused, such as sitting in a room and publishing, whereas a chair is a different skill set and we're looking for emotional intelligence and more general skills. Um, there's a wealth of studies that show that uh, there's some basic uh, mismatches, such as uh, uh, instructors and professors, uh, majority of us assume that students are responsible for the learning. And when they conduct similar uh, surveys of students, 
they find that the students believe that um, the professor's role is to provide the learning. And so if you're thinking like a marriage counselor, you can often have two groups that are, are not even starting on the same page. And then of course, recently we have social media and Netflix. And so if we're trying to engage students and often this can involve some sort of dynamic presentation or uh, uh, presentation of your personality, some effort to entertain, you're now competing against 15 second TikTok videos and Netflix and so uh, we just can't compete with that. There's no way you can be more entertaining than that uh, when you're doing uh, hours of a class. Um, I think uh, my epiphany for this came years ago when I was teaching sex crimes, and I figured that's a more interesting and dynamic class than uh, let's say when I teach theory or research methods. And uh, I maintained eye contact with a student and watched him fall asleep while I was presenting. <laughs> so I thought, well, if he's falling asleep while I'm talking about this and, and this topic, uh, what's happening when this student is going to other classes? And so um, I started to look for other ways and, and other solutions to this kind of wall that we face. Um, and I think most of us uh, face it and we often think we're alone. So the first thing I did is I started thinking about my classes as a problem statement or how can I access students? How can I get past this wall? And then I started looking for tools. So rather than changing my role, I started looking for diverse tools, which essentially is the topic of this webinar. And then I taught some classes. I was fortunate enough to teach classes over a number of years. So I, could kept, I kept returning to the same uh, classes um, and, and I could keep returning and keep working on them and trying new things. So one thing as a criminologist we face um, is that uh, people, tend to know or think they know more about crime and the criminal justice system uh, than, than we do. So if I'm looking at who's attending today, we have the hard sciences and chemistry and biology, education, nursing, language. If I wanted to know something about that topic, I would come and ask you a question. Uh, as a criminologist, you'd be surprised how many times people tell me things, but they're not asking me any sort of expertise. Um, and this is often because uh, crime has a lot to do with uh, people's upbringing, demographics, uh, their experiences, but often their lack of experience. Um, and one of the old jokes is we never tell anyone on a plane what we do because you're about to hear for the whole plane ride uh, how to change the world and how to change criminal justice. Uh, the other thing about criminal justice is it produces a lot of emotions. So if you were to think of um, a recent event, and I could do this at any point in time, that involves crime, and I think most of you could think of one big one, uh, but you probably have a lot of feelings about uh, a recent uh, criminal event that you saw in the news, uh, whether that pro led to feelings of justice or injustice or uh, regardless of the political spectrum, um, you'll base uh, you, a lot of your uh, your beliefs on myths, stereotypes, misconceptions, even if you don't feel that's the case. Uh, and so when I get students in my class, uh, I found that they also do the same thing. Um, my class that I'm talking about today is a upper level undergrad class, writing intensive, and it deals with criminal justice and mental health. Uh, so in our um, society right now, the three biggest mental health facilities are prisons and jails. And as students who do go into the workforce are going to be encountering this issue, so it's important they get a, a, an understanding of what's going on, because when they don't, um, it leads to injuries in uh, mentally ill offenders and inmates, and also to uh, themselves as, as, as uh, staff working in the field. Um, it also, for people not going into the field or maybe going to law school or some other uh, outlet, it's important that they kind of get an understanding of these things, um, but how can I give them experiential learning? Uh, you can see the system as a whole is uh, overwhelming and it basically moves from the left, which is a person interacts with police, to the purple in the middle, which is courts, and usually where I become involved, which is the yellow side, which is corrections, which is uh, prison, jail, probation and parole. Um, so one thing that I tried to do in the past was to do tours of prison, uh, but we faced, um, it's risky, um, not so much for violence, but it puts the staff, it gives, it, it inconveniences them, it makes it difficult. Um, and it also creates, in some cases, a zoo effect. 
And so you'll go to a cell, for example, and the inmate will say, oh, I don't mind if you look in my cell. Uh, but the but the students walking into that cell will see, you know, a diary and a toothbrush and personal effects. And I'll feel like I feel like I'm kind of touring a zoo. And I published articles on this. So I kind of hit hit a wall about how do I really engage them uh, and move beyond a TV. So one thing about cops and locked up that may never occur to you when you watch these shows is uh, those shows always show an outside in perspective. So you're always looking at an offender in a police car. You're always looking at an inmate in a cell. But a lot of the things I'm teaching involves concepts and research that involves being inside the cell looking out, or at least giving people that understanding. So uh, one of the game changers for me was uh, uh, being an associate at the incubator and also taking uh, Augie's um, VR boot camp for the first summer that it was held several years ago. Uh, the boot camp is divided into 360 videos, which is probably the lowest end, which is what I'm doing, talking about today, and um, moving to uh, augmented reality and all the way up to virtual. So if you ever take that boot camp or have an interest, it works for all of our fields and it really can take it as high and as in-depth and as interesting and high-tech as you want. Um, those things combined were great and then as part of that I found the more that I interacted with colleagues from other departments the better my teaching became. The more that I stayed within my own wheelhouse and spoke to my colleagues actually did a disservice to me because I, we ended up kind of doing the same thing. So uh, one thing I'd like to show you that I developed as a result of these experiences, okay. with help from um, the boot camp and the center, uh, so the incubation center, I created this. This is a project that I use for my students, but it's also for the general public. And it's a, basically a tour of the criminal justice system in, 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 from kind of following that map that I showed earlier. And um, anyone can take it and it's kind of designed to uh, deal with myths and, and all these other things while also promoting emotions. I should say before I begin in my class, um, I don't want to promote too many emotions. So I have students, for example, that may not want to do this and they have an alternative assignment um, where, where they can write a paper or do something different that's comparable. Um, and also I have a bunch of trigger warnings and everything else, um, particularly for the mental health sides of things. So um, it starts off with an about me page it moves on to something called Food for Thought, which uh, talks about topics that uh, people often think they know about, but there, there's misconceptions like how much does it cost to house an inmate? Uh, how many of our mentally ill inmates, what's the population in jail and prison? How many for violent crimes, visitation, and uh, what percentage come back? I'm not gonna tell you the answers for those. You, you'll have to go and do the tour and enjoy the tour yourself. Uh, but I'll give you a quick look at the tour. I think I have about two minutes on my timer. So uh, the students would start the tour here. They start with police. I'll move on to one that I'd like to show you. They go to courts. They go to jail. And then this is a really good one. This one involves visitation. It's a New York Times 360 video. They can also maximize this. They can use it uh, with the headset as well. So they can look at this on there. Um, computer, they can even look on their phone, or if they have a Oculus or a virtual headset, they can actually do the full experience. Um, so this is a real visitation experience with real families uh, narrating. They can move around the bus, and I'll go forward. They can also see what happens in a real visitation, how, how is it constructed. So this gives them a different look from what they might see on TV. Um, you're seeing kids, you're seeing humanity, you're seeing hearing, empathy, you're seeing education, don't know exactly when and I get those out. types of things. So was, keep moving on. Solitary confinement. And part of what we do here is um, start looking at a sense of space. I didn't realize that uh, things to I'd convey be spending because, five and a half years of my um, life It's hard to get an idea of what that type of space looks like. They can look at the room. I, uh, and so on. Remember what? Let me just go back to solitary. I try to pick ones that don't have too much 
you know, creepy and music or over dramatic. Getting into a fight. These things are pretty. Um, 360 videos illness. are very common now. Or if you need protection from other inmates. Everything from Russians, Russian prisons to it could be you uh, testing positive death for row. drugs. And what I'm trying to do is convey a sense of like what's in the cell or simply and a sense of space. Guard. These things people cannot experience, and I can't take them to where I conduct my research all the time. And at the end, they move on to a uh, learn more where there's additional readings and answers to those questions that were asked earlier. Just a couple more slides here. And um, so the last part of uh, using these tools that I would suggest is to stick with it. So this course is almost 10 years old and it started with a, a grant with CTE and working with the experts down there. Um, and this was an internal grant. And I was fortunate this, this class was kind of my baby and I would suggest if you find one that's your baby, keep requesting it. Um, and so between that 2012 and 2019, the boot camp happened as well as the teaching incubator. And it really put this class on steroids so eventually it passed a provost review and then recently it got a couple of awards for uh, innovation and um, the use of technology and that's really a credit to CTE and the incubator more than me because they gave me the tools to, to be able to do this and of course I can now uh, transition this to to my other classes uh, but I would suggest taking those if you can um, particularly that boot camp we had people from all different disciplines and as I mentioned, I got more out of that than um, talking to my colleagues. I found it to be uh, really interesting. One of the reasons for that is you're not talking about content. So if I'm, for example, evaluating a colleague of mine and they're lecturing, I'm actually thinking about the content, whether that's geology or chemistry. So if you're talking about something uh, that I have no idea about, like uh, in the incubator, uh, someone was talking about uh, sea turtles. I don't know anything about sea turtles. So now I'm not really thinking, of, I'm learning about sea turtles, but I'm not questioning, I'm not being critical. I'm now thinking about the teaching side of things. It moves it away from content a little bit more to process. And one other additional icing on the cake is measuring. So I've taken this experience in two states uh, just to test it, to make sure that my uh, intuitions have some validity when you empirically test it. Um, and uh, this is in two different states with five classes, 242 students. And w we did find um, that it did facilitate learning. It challenged uh, crime myths. Students were blown away by these uh, videos. And even though it's, it's at the low end of virtual reality, um, it really elevated their emotional investment. Uh, they were very appreciative of visual learning because they said so much of our university experience is not that. Um, they, they reported they uh, felt like it was more realistic, more motivated to learn. Uh, they could remember things and a deeper meaning. And these were, there's a, a range of quali qualitative themes that emerge as well as uh, quantitative. Um, and there was a lot of uh, validation of the whole experience. And as I said, these 360 videos are now available pretty much in every field and they're only growing and emerging. So with that, I'll turn it over to the amazing Rhonda. Thank you so much. So my project as a teaching associate with the incubator was called Cat Corner. So named because we were talking about conversations about teaching and use the C-A-T which became Cat Corner. The idea was simple. I wanted to discover and grow innovative teaching within the College of Arts and Sciences. So I facilitate a conversation with three to five faculty members from different disciplines within the college. And I ask them, what do you do to get your students excited about what you're teaching? Over 50 facu faculty members have now participated and the results are actually pretty impressive. I write a blog entry for each of the conversations and post that to our incubator blog. And I now have a special section for Cat Corner. But I chose four of our participants that I believe highlight the four pillars of Kavanaugh's How Do We Make Our Teaching More Engaging? The first of those pillars was that cognitive resources are limited. Emotion trumps. This is Patty Walker. She teaches a public speaking class and she uses theater ex 
exercises to get her students lower stress and more engaged at the beginning of her class. So one of the exercises that she uses is called the end of the world. She takes all of her students and she puts them in a giant circle. And the idea of the game is that one person starts the game by making eye contact with someone across the room. They have to ask without words, can I come take your spot? The student responds with an audible yes. Now the first person starts moving to take the second person's spot. The second person now has to make eye contact with someone across the room and ask without words, can I come take your spot? That person responds yes, and they start to move across the room. Now the third person has to do the same. You can tell that this gets a little complicated and eventually the scenario gets too complicated. The communication breaks down and the whole situation blows up and the whole class shouts, boom! Like it's the end of the entire world. But the truth is that it's not. It's just funny, right? Like our communication broke down, the, the, game, the game is broken, but it's not really a big deal. And Patty uses that to tell her students that in real life, when you're learning, mistakes are no big deal. When you're public speaking, nobody's perfect. Everybody makes those mistakes. My favorite quote that she gave was that when you think about public speaking, you're really having a conversation but only one of you is making noise. Our second pillar was that persona and performance matter. I spoke with Mercedes Lopez Rodriguez, who teaches Spanish classes, and we all know that learning a foreign language can be somewhat intimidating. Mercedes said that she herself considers herself a shy person, but when she walks in to teach a class, she has this larger than life personality. She stands with confidence, she walks with confidence, she speaks with confidence, and she encourages her students to do the same. The idea is that we manifest what we believe. If you act confident and you believe yourself to be confident, maybe eventually you actually will become more confident. She has the students turn their desks so they can look at each other when they're having a conversation look one another in the eye when they're speaking. And she also said she likes to share her research with her students so that as she's excited about the material, maybe she can invoke that emotional contagion and get them excited about the material as well. She said sometimes it works in the opposite direction too, that if she's feeling a little down and out, one of the students will ask a question about her research and she'll get excited about it. Like, oh yeah, I do love this stuff. Let me explain it to you. So um, I thought she was a great representation of that persona and performance matter. Our third pillar was we are intensely social creatures. Teresa Clement, who teaches criminology, doesn't like me to use her picture, which is why you don't have a picture of her here but she is amazing. She teaches large criminology classes to students. Uh, she'll have as many as 200 students. She uses a seating chart from the first day. She walks around so that she can speak to the students by name. She asks them about their life. What are you doing this weekend? Are you going to the football game? Where did you grow up? What's your family like? And as she's speaking, she said she always notices that some of the students that sit close will jump in on the conversation. Oh, yeah, I went to that game, too. Or, you know, I saw that TV show. So she's building community, not just between her and the students, but also between the students themselves. She wants to create an environment where if one of them hurts, they all hurt and take that idea to the real world because she wants her students to realize that criminals are just regular people who may be made bad decisions. If you think about criminals as real people, you understand a little more about reform and justice than if you think about them as others. She said she wanted her students to feel a part of something rather than apart from something. She wants them to feel together. She wants them to feel that community. She actually started a program called 
coffee with Clement so she could extend this idea beyond her classroom and come get a coffee, cup of coffee with me, have a conversation. Our last pillar was that stories are our most natural form of thought. And I had Joe November, he teaches a history of science class. And one of the things that he said he brings into his class is called reading an artifact. So he hands out pictures to the students and each student gets a picture of an item that they don't recognize. And it's key that they don't recognize it. If they recognize it, they're supposed to trade it back and get something else. So they're looking at something from history that they have no idea what it is, what it's used for, and they're supposed to start asking questions. So they ask, what is this? What is it used for? Why is it useful? How was it produced? How is it transported? How is it sold? Um, all of these questions to think about how many people were involved in the history of this particular artifact. And they're supposed to go find those answers. So students are more engaged with the topic because they came up with the questions themselves. And he said that he wants this idea to travel with them beyond his classes. So as he sends them out into the real world, he, he wants them picking up objects and thinking to themselves like, hmm, what is this and where did it come from and, and what's the history of this particular object? And lastly, I wanted to share with you, I feel like I've gone really fast now, but um, I'm going to share with you our cat map that kind of tells you about all the cats. So this was just four, but like I said, we have had over 50 at this point. So this is the incubator's blog, where you can find the blog articles from Cat Corner. If you go directly to this page, um, you can find the Cat Corner art archive, which has the articles, the Cat Corner alumni, which has the people who have participated, and really fun, we have a cat map. So if I pull up the cat map, this gives you a little map of campus, basically. And you see all of these little pins. So the pins are color coded by conversation. You can look through everybody that was in the same conversation has the same color pin. And these are locations on campus. So if you zoom in and you become interested about a particular pin, you can click on it. So this is mathematics. Here's Neil Bornstein. This is the Humanities Building. If you're not familiar with campus, this is Gambrell. And if we move this way, um, you can tell uh, as I zoom out, lots of little pins on this map, even a couple down here in the School of Music, which isn't technically the College of Arts and Sciences, but had a few people participate outside of the College of Arts and Sciences. The little cat paw is me, and the little cat is where our incubator location is. Previously, I had these conversations in person. I've had quite a few this semester and last semester um, virtually so that I could speak to people through Teams and be socially distanced. But each pin has the person who participated, but also a little link at the bottom that goes to their particular cat corner. So if you click on the link at the bottom, you get to the article that was written that features the person that I just clicked on. So this is a great way to explore if you're interested in Cat Corner. If you go first to the Cat Map, you can find people who might be in your same department. If you are in the College of Arts and Sciences, learn a little bit more about our people on campus. Let's see if I can get all my pins in there. It's kind of fun when uh, I can't fit all the pins in one screen. But our original screen also, if you want to look for a particular person's name or you want to look from a conversation that you've read, um, you can also do this in the opposite direction. You can click on a person who is on the left and it will show you where their pin is. So I had a lot of fun putting this together. But as I said, you can click through and get to the blog articles and learn more about it and I hope you will 
And as new faculty, I hope you will also consider coming to have a conversation with me. I would love to have more people involved. Thank you so much for sharing your tips, techniques, experiences, and the work of Cat Corner with everyone. We will now open the Q&A session. I just wanted to call your attention just to two things on this last slide. Uh, there is a link to the um, incubator blog that I will also copy on the chat box. And you have my email address if you want to talk about any ideas or if you just want to visit us virtually at the incubator, our virtual doors are open to you. So let's just open the floor, let's open the floor for questions. Have any of you noticed any impact on your course evaluations from uh, implementing these tools? I learned that through the uh, role playing, the reacting to the past, the students, the students responded with a lot more excitement in their evaluations, um, saying mostly they learned more than they expected to, um, which was a good thing. It showed that they got engaged in terms of um, being able to do the role playing in the classroom. Yeah, I'll, I'll support what Kristen said. Uh, I put in the chat, um, Kristen Chichamari used reacting to the past in Geology 101. I think it's sort of the environmental science um, reacting to the past thing that you, you had up on the screen at some point. And we happened to be collecting data last semester in the labs on which labs the students found the most interesting. And the reacting to the past labs a uh, couple of, of weeks outperformed all of our other kind of regular labs like the students reported them as much more engaging much more interesting they got invested in a way that they hadn't before so it totally supported everything that that Kristen has said and, and what we know about the reacting to the past and I'll just add like when we did our lit review on active learning strategies role playing is one of those things that takes such a huge investment of time if you're starting from scratch but those guidebooks that Kristen mentioned are fantastic. They really are complete resources um, to get you going if that's something that you're interested in. When role playing plus group work, the usual group work is terrible and so and so doesn't pull their weight, issues crept in again. That tends to happen. I was wondering, Kristen, if maybe part of the rubric, the rubrics that you got took care of that where everybody knew what their role was and um, there was really no way of wiggling out of the responsibilities? Um, yes, the difficulty I faced was with the pandemic. Um, certain students had connectivity issues and logging on, or they had health issues, um, stress issues. And so that took a little more navigating and I did have to give a little more leniency with that. But what I found with the particular one that I did is that the students wanted to do certain, they picked certain aspects of the performance or of the presentation. And they really, because they were able to pick how they wanted to do it and how they could contribute, that um, I got more contributions in terms of group work than I did in traditional group work um, activities. So, yeah. Thanks. It's still and, there. It's still a problem. Yeah, that, that tends to happen sometimes with group work where one person takes up more of the responsibility and then the other person is just kind of um you know piggyback writing on 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 that person personally i find that um i haven't resolved the issue completely but having a rubric that clearly delineates uh what they're responsible for and then having students show what they've done to to meet those um those points has helped me but if anybody else again uh wants to pitch in their own ideas we welcome oh. that I've got a potential solution. So the, the, the evals and group work are two things discussed and they, you'll find they come up a lot. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's always an issue. So in terms of evals, um, I'm going to be blunt and honest. Most evals are directly co correlated to grade distribution. If you go and look at all the faculty with the good evals, they grading high and so a lot of it has to do with that calculation that I mentioned where it's like what am I putting into this and what, what's my grade. Uh, it's like behavioralism 101. Um, so when I, that's for the reason that when I try these new things out in my class I do a separate 
even if it's an evaluation or a publication for myself on that topic, because you'll find you have to ask them specific questions about role playing, virtual reality, to get that data from them. Because I think that I'm a little bit um, cynical about student evals. They'll say, oh, I like the, they tend to say, I like the professor and what's my grade? And rate my professor will tell you that as well. Uh, we have a couple of teachers that actually will grade hard and still get good evaluations and they're your high flyers, but it's usually a, a straight line in terms of those two things. Um, the group work, I found the only solution because it's also a calculation and usually what you've got there is slackers going, how do I do the minimum to get the most? That's their calculation, right? And so one tool that I use is to weigh heavily on an individual component of the group work, but keep a component of, let's say it's 100%, do 10 or 20% for the group activity, but make them write a paper or something for the 80%. So then when I have groups blow up, and whether it's in class or not, and the person comes to you with that sense of injustice, back to criminal justice, but when they come back to you with that sense of injustice and say, I can't even get Jimmy on to, to show up and Sally's over here saying that, and I'm the only one in a group of five doing anything, then you say, it's going to be okay because you know you're going to get, you know, 80 out of 80 on the points or 90 out of 90 and the group thing is 10%, you're going to be okay. They're not. Because the people who are not doing the work on the group are not going to do great on those individual things. That's what, That's the only solution that I found. So have a combined individual group and heavily weigh the, the, um, the individual component as a, as a check. So I'll, I'll add, I use student contracts uh, with mine because I, quite frankly, with 170 up to 250 students, I never want to hear how the groups are going. I mean, I do. I care about them, but like I can't handle the email back and forth or, or all of that. Um, and so what I have students do early on in the semester is lay out contracts with their group. So what are the expectations? We're going to do the work by such and such a date. We're going to do the reading by such and such a date. We will all have completed the pre-lab and discussed it by Tuesday. Um, all of these things. And then they also have to agree what is grounds for getting kicked out of a group. Um, so if someone fails to meet those expectations three times, and they're documented, um, then they can they can oust the person from their group. And that, that person now has to do all the group work individually, so there's a high stakes for that person to kind of live up to the agreement that they they started the semester with, right? Like, they, they agreed to it, they signed on to it. It's not me saying, well, you know, Susie doesn't like you and doesn't wanna work with you anymore, like, I don't wanna be involved. <laughs> um, and I have found that eliminates almost all of the the kind of emails behind the scenes back and forth and it encourages um, students to to really like just get their work done because again there's some social pressure there so there's there's some emotional engagement there's community engagement um, and it's not intended to be punitive it's just intended to like make everybody's expectations clear um, from the start of the semester so one of the things that I wanted to share about Teresa that I didn't because I overlooked it. Um, one of the things that she mentioned is that she plays music at the beginning of her classes to get her students to talk to one another. And she said she discovered it by accident. And the students, when they hear music, will talk to one another versus when you just leave it silent, they all play on their phones. And she said she doesn't know why it's a difference, but she thinks part of it is because she brings in music from like the 50s or the 60s or sometimes in a foreign language. And she highlights music that the students have never heard before, and somehow that sparks conversation between them. So she said it was an easy thing. She doesn't even remember why she played music the first time, but it was an easy thing to get her students to talk, talking to one another uh, before class. I thought that was really interesting. I've done that with my Spanish classes, and it, it, it really works and helps to set the mood and, and the Spanish mode, you know, have them switch from English to Spanish. Well, I had a, well, I had a I, quick comment, if, if you don't mind. 
Um, I was really interested, even though I was presenting and I knew what everybody was presenting on, it was really fascinating how they connected in my mind with the idea of the colleagues talking to other colleagues and then hearing um, from both Catherine and Hayden with this idea of assessment in terms of attention is the cost that we pay and then this calculated idea of, and, and you know, being in the English department, we don't use those terms. And so that was really fascinating to think about it like, oh, that's a quantitative way to think of the learning. So that was really helpful to me, like like uh, Rhonda mentioned with the map, to, to learn from other uh, disciplines and departments how how they think differently, but how it's still applicable to what I'm using. So thank you. <laughs> that's one of the things before I started doing Cat Corner, I've been teaching at this university since uh, 2004 as an instructor, but I was a student here. So I've been on campus since 1998. And people used to ask me, oh, do you know so-and-so? They also work at USC. It's like, are they in the math department? Because otherwise, no. And I, I mean, I've been here 15 years and I felt like I really didn't know anybody outside of my own department. And that's not true anymore. And I have these conversations and I keep them kind of small the conversations are great, but then there's the blog post that that kind of grows that beyond the conversation and spreads it throughout the campus if people are reading the blog. Um, and then, you know, you can find contact information with that person and kind of develop these little networks of learning. We want our students to do this, but it's rewarding for me to help our faculty members do that as well. And that's kind of the idea of if we can connect people who are already using innovative teaching strategies in their classrooms and get them to work together and we can get that to grow. Um, that's one of my main goals and I've been really excited to see it come together. <laughs>